Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business Radio, the show about ways to stay competitive in a changing market, break through business plateaus, and respond to the changing expectations of today's customers. Your host, Jess Duell, is a rapid growth entrepreneur, consultant, and business advocate with a 20-year track record of business excellence. She candidly discusses how to achieve your growth strategy and realize your company's unfulfilled potential. Now, here's Jess. This program is about what it means to reach short-term goals and increase confidence in long-term positioning for our companies. This is program 185, You Are Leading by Example. And today, I have two incredible people joining joining me to talk about this important topic, You Are Leading by Example. Carl Dearshaw is a business coach helping businesses in the same position as yours to meet their goals and put systems in place to create growth. Debbie Slews is a child care director of a multi-site organization and entrepreneur as a personal empowerment and development coach at Dare to Declare. Did I actually pronounce your name correctly, Debbie? You did. You did. Good. I was just, I've been practicing. I, I saw that. I saw that. It was intentional. It's not what yeah. I would have guessed, but <laughs> yeah, I I have to ask everybody. They've got such great names. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad to have you both on the show today. And this is super exciting for me because this particular topic is near and dear to my heart. This uh, do what we say and not what we do kind of conversation. Are we really in alignment with our actions and our words and the fact that our actions do speak louder than words and who knows what else is going to come out of the conversation today. So I've asked you each to prepare a short answer before we start our dialogue to answer this question. What kind of example are you setting for your team? And Carl, would you like to go and share sure. yours? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is a, such a powerful question because you're right. It's all about the behavior that you display. Um, you know, all the words that you can say are fine and honestly, it doesn't really matter that much. It's about people are always observing what you do. And so, um, you know, I have been and am involved in a wide variety of teams um, in the workplace, in what I do with small fish and um, activities at church and other charitable organizations, things like that. And it really has come to me around um, the sense of integrity and authenticity. Um, and, you know, that it's really about the consistency between your actions and your intentions and your words. Because when people pick up differences between those, it can be absolutely demoralizing. It can break trust in an instant. And so, you know, if you're gonna say uh, it's important to be on time, then to be on time and to have ways to deal with when you're not. Um, if it's important to always operate from a position of trust uh, and honesty, well, then that means that you're gonna have to admit your failures in front of other people as, as the example of, here's what you do when you mess up. Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's a messy kind of thing. And so um, for me, it's been that um, authenticity and integrity, and that's what builds relationships, that's what builds trust, that, that's what builds um, people's uh, desire to follow you as a leader. Debbie, what kind of example are you setting for your team? Well, I think it began just in a practical sense this afternoon when I knew I was going to be coming on this radio show. I talked to two of my leaders. Uh, one is a supervisor, another is um, more of a pro in program and supervisor. And I don't even know if she sees herself as a leader. So I asked her, um, I asked them the question. So what example are they setting for their team? And um, so they, so, so I think even just by doing that, by including them in this process already demonstrates the fact that um, I know I can't do this by myself. So I, it is a team. It's not an, I'm not an island. I'm not um, the sole decision maker. And also we're so much better when we collaborate. So I think 
um, by doing it in a very practical sense, even in this aspect, um, I was able to demonstrate that. Um, I think that the example that I offer to our team is that I continue to learn. I love learning. Um, in all different ways. I love learning through uh, formalized workshops, through webinars, through discussions, through collaboration. That's one of my favorite ways actually to learn is through mentorship, through coaching. Um, I really enjoy having deep discussions with our educators and I learn from them every day. So I think that's the kind of example that I am uh, to the educators is continue your love of learning um, and that for the sheer joy of it. Thank you for sharing those answers. It gives us a chance to understand the perspective in with which you are showing up now, what your intentions are for the show today, as well as now being able to set the stage for the dialogue that we are going to have going back and forth as we dig into different areas of this. And something that came up for me as I'm listening to both of the answers that you shared is that uh, sometimes we don't know what we don't know and it gets in our way. So what are your experiences and even approaches to how can we get out of our own way? I mean, that's a, a really deep question, isn't it? That um, because that gets to what it means to uh, be human with all of our imperfections and failings and uh, everything like that. So. Um, a lot of it to me is when you're working with a team, when you're leading a team, to be developing something that's larger than any individual on the team, including you, yourself as leader. Um, you know, the larger mission, purpose, whatever it is, um, that's what really helps people to pull together and to realize uh, something larger. And uh, actually, I find that it um, makes people more tolerant to change and to mistakes and things like that. Um, because uh, there's a sense of a bigger why, uh, of uh, why we're together doing this, why it's us, why, uh, why it's important, that kind of thing. The question was how to get out of my own way. Is that, is that what you're asking? So I think um, oftentimes um, I put up a ceiling for myself. So my, my own potential or where, you know, how far I can go in terms of my leadership and uh, my goal setting. And that has to do with confidence, right? So it has to do with the fact that I lose confidence. Um, so, um, but that's my own thoughts and I can change those. Um, I also think that getting out of my own way would be uh, by growing leaders. So, so to focus on those that are around me, that I see their amazing uh, potential and skills and giving them the platform, giving them the resources, giving them the time um, necessary to grow them as leaders. I see that as, as an amazing um, opportunity as a leader to grow leaders. And then um, to really focus on what's my inner genius. So not to get too hung up on some of, like having to do all the tasks and to be really, an expert in all areas of leadership. So to get so to get out of my own way and that I can delegate some of that or you know offer that to others who can do it better and focus on what's my inner genius. There's an interesting element in what you just shared, each of you, and that's around our ability to focus. And it makes me think um, you know, and, and I'm thinking about the Voice of Bold Business Radio team. I'm thinking about the whole Red Direction team. And I know one of the ways, I, I know that it's easy, okay? So it is easy for others to let people who take action and make decisions always take action and make decisions. And so I know I work incredibly diligently and make sure to focus my awareness on is that happening at any point in time? Am I the one taking action and um, making decisions? Is somebody else on the team uh, taking action and making decisions? And are we all getting a little complacent or not? And I know, so when we don't know what we don't know, 
or we're lacking focus, or we're pulled in many different directions, or we're facing a crisis. It's interesting to see the dynamics that will pop up in, in, these, in different teams. And so there's this element of, of discipline, of being able to pause, to be able to pause and go, you know, I am leading by example, and whatever I'm allowing, meaning what's actually happening around me in the team, is going to become part of the culture. And I think that's a slippery slope when we don't know what we don't know. I, I'm curious what you think about that. The not knowing, um, I believe, is a, uh, a real challenge because in our culture, uh, that's interpreted as being weakness. And so uh, what I'd like to do is to reframe things as uh, learning. You know, it... it it can come across kind of fakey sometimes that uh, is say, well, you know, everything's a learning opportunity and there is no such thing as failure. And so I, I understand <laughs> that comes across as a, a bit fake, um, but uh, there's a lot of truth to that. And uh, the fact is that we will go through life um, and through our roles as leaders, uh, making all kinds of failures. I do think that we tend to overblow a lot of them where something that was a, a setback maybe or uh, not the turn out the way you had hoped it would or something like that, you know, and we instantly put this big label on it about uh, failure. And what that does is it makes you resistant to the not knowing. It's like, well, then I've got to know everything before I take any kind of risk. Um, and uh, that is a, an absolutely dangerous slope to go in because, of course, we're challenged to uh, move quickly as organizations to uh, adapt to changing realities, whether it's competitors or employees or the government or, you know, all of the different forces that are um, working on you these days. Uh, we're at task to be responding very quickly. And so... Um, going into the not knowing and saying, well, that's going to cause me to just analyze stuff to death. Um, that gets you in trouble really fast. So, so our challenge as leaders is to say, I will constantly work on how do I become more comfortable with uh, not knowing. Um, for me, one of the things that I've had to go back on is, well, um, I tend to be a smart guy so I can figure stuff out. And so I'm relying on my own skills to adapt on the fly. And um, most of the time that actually works reasonably well. You know, it's not that I don't, don't make mistakes or anything, but um, it's, uh, it gives me the more of a sense of personal resilience to say that I can rely on my own skills, but then also the people around me. Okay, so I've got a certain set of people around me in different groups and stuff like that that have a high level of trust with and it's not that i trust that they'll never make a mistake because we all do but um the fact that together as a team we can figure it out and do a reasonably correct thing for any decision we have to make that's i don't know that's kind of vague maybe but that's the way i work on it I, I, I'm here, basically it's, hey, you've just invited a whole bunch of people to consider where they might be and a, and a whole bunch of different doorways to take that first step in evaluating. Yeah, so absolutely. I don't necessarily think it was diffuse or vague. I think it was an invitation to consider. I'll just put that out there. Absolutely. I, yeah. I think you're, you've hit it on the head that, um, you know, it's, it's really about us relating as humans. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, trust is much more resilient and much easier to maintain when you don't focus too much on hierarchical relationships and stuff like that and say, well, I'm the boss, so therefore I must be the smartest person in the room. Um, that's actually very disrespectful to fall into that pattern. And so to be able to open it up to others and, and say, well, you know, all of us have our areas of strength and weakness and expertise and whatever. And I happen to be given 
the job of boss in this particular case. So um, that's my role, but that doesn't mean that I have the answers to everything. You know, it's just that I'm tasked with um, driving things to decisions say, mm -hmm. um, rather than being smart. Oh. If I could just reach out and give you a hug, I would. <laughs> I <bet. laughs> That's awesome, Carl. Debbie, you've been sitting there and I'm seeing on your face, those of you who are listening, you can't see Debbie. Um, those of you watching might be seeing some of Debbie and she's like, I've got something to say here. Yep, yep. <laughs> Well, just to add to that, I think that um, as an example, um, as a leader, I definitely want to accept responsibility for my actions. And so even though I don't know what I don't know, and I can't anticipate all the change that may occur, I am present. Um, and that even means physically. It means that my, um, my team needs to be able to see me. They need to be able to interact with me physically, or it could be that, you know, that I'm opening the channels through social media, like, or through email, but that I'm leaving myself available so that they can connect in with me. So I think by being present as well, um, I'm able to then adapt and able to keep them abreast of what's going on. And um, as I discover new things, as I find out information, I can pass that forward to them. But again, as I said, to take responsibility uh, for decisions, to um, give liberty for them to make decisions. I think that sometimes that permission sometimes just needs to be um, said in a direct way that you have permission to make, be able to make this decision and that gives a sense of freedom and liberty uh, that definitely grows your team. Both of you indicated ongoing learning is an important part of yeah. your development of self, your development of leader and your development to be able to help others develop when they're ready and they meet you there. Um, I actually started the Voice of Bold Business Radio to do that. Uh, I learned through conversation. I learned through asking questions. I learned from hearing amazing, crazy stories, amazing, unimaginable problems, and then being able to talk through that. And because of that, I'm like, hey, I could do this in a way that others can come and do the same thing. And so I took something that was a way that I learned because I'm gonna do it anyway. and made it a little, gave it a higher bar. Now I'm going to share it with others and then said, now let's just have a set of programs that that's what we're focusing on. That's what we're doing. And so this is finding people, uh, doing the show notes, creating the elements of it, doing the research beforehand. And then the actual conversations is an incredible learning process for me. And that is, uh, I would say that that is the most regular commitment that I make to learning is by committing to show up and continue to have more programs on these topics for our listeners. Um, the neat thing I like about that, Jess, is that um, you structured it in a way that you can go where you find things interesting, um, which really serves the people who are following you because that, that's often a similar things. Uh, when Debbie started off, um, she talked about um, a number of learning opportunities that were relatively structured um, you know, classes and books and uh, videos and things like that. And that's pretty cool. Um, I find that I'm migrating more towards experiential learning um, and towards uh, let's just jump in and do it and see what happens. And if you can do it in a relatively safe way to begin with, that's cool. Um, but uh, for instance, I've been uh, doing short little videos uh, to support my uh, social media outreach. And, um, you know, I didn't feel comfortable with that beginning. But then I thought, hey, I'm, I'm doing these videos for a few friends. And just, you know, 60 seconds. That's what I'll do. Uh, I'll keep it nice and simple. And um, so as I go through that, because I've been doing it for over a year now, I'm uh, becoming more comfortable with doing that kind of thing. So that's not surprising. Um, but I've learned a whole bunch of new things about how do you reach people in that kind of format? How do you make it effective? What do people respond to and what do they find boring? And um, so there's a whole lot of um, learning that I would have never have gotten by going to some class or something like that. Even if they said it, I probably wouldn't pay attention, right? So I have to, <laughs> have to actually do it 
Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's been my mode now for several years is to focus mostly on those. Now, there are some just absolutely mind-blowing things. I love um, following TED Talks. I've got a number of podcasts that I follow, things like that. Um, and, you know, that, that's great, but I don't want it to just be limited to sitting back and being passive. Um, you know, I've got to fit, pick some things where I jump in and be active. I would agree with that. And, and I've just started um, attending a think tank. So it's divine feminine business women. And, and we get together and we've just met twice now in the month and, um, and we challenge each other. And it's a, a mentor style where um, somebody facilitates it, and, but it's very loose, you know, the topic. And we all support each other and raise each other up as entrepreneurial women. So um, that has been very uh, enriching to my life in terms of, like you said, experiential, um, in that I'm experiencing these amazing conversations, um, a different outlook. We're looking at our whole community. I'm look, you know, we're looking at it through this woman's lens and then through my lens and, and taking a look at, okay, so what's going on with our community and how can we grow it with each one of our different types of businesses? So um, those kinds of conversations spark my fire. Like I, I just get so excited when I learn in that, in that way. So I also agree. I think um, learning is, for me, it's done in different ways. I like the formal aspect of workshops, but I also, I actually find conversations and collaboration some of the best way to learn. Um, and I, and I'm, I think, I believe I'm a, keen, a good listener. And that's a, an amazing way to learn. And when I find like what Jessica does, which is finding keywords, and then I make them connect. And uh, I just had it with a government, um, a, new, a new regulation. And I just pulled out these two words. They talked about relationship and caring. And that's our profession with childcare, relationship and caring. And I'm like, wow, that just makes things so crystal clear. We needed that. We, and, and it's so simple, two words. But how amazing is that going to be for me in my leadership um, and in my professional development with our educators that I can make things that clear? to say, focus on relationships, focus on care. Wow. And that was out of a workshop, but I was able to pull those two words and really crystallize them. So I love when that happens, that kind of learning happens. You are listening to The Voice of Bold Business Radio. In every program, we share stories, tips, and concepts that benefit short-term goals and increase confidence in long-term positioning. Stay current and receive programs to continue sparking ideas about growth strategy by subscribing to the program at voiceofboldbusiness.com. Now, back to Jess. You are listening to program 185. You are leading by example. And I'm talking with Debbie Sluz of Dare to Declare and Carl Deershaw of Smallfish about leading by example. We started out with a fabulous part of the conversation uh, answering this question. What kind of example are you setting for your team? And we went to a whole bunch of different places and we had just taken a break as we were wrapping up. Where do we learn and how do we learn? Just the crew of us right here. The question that I, I was thinking about as you were talking, Debbie, I, maybe I should ask both of you this. Um, I'm seeing a shift now in... Uh, the way people are relating to technology versus human contact. Um, and people don't seem to be talking about it yet, but when I uh, look at how my kids operate or other people that I work with, um, I think people are starting to rediscover that the true learning opportunities come from having relationships with actual people. And yeah, it may be a person you're interacting with through a social media channel or through your phone or whatever, um, but the recognition that it's it's all about the the people to people connections, and I was wondering if you ladies are seeing that as well. I'm going to go first. So I I agree. I think that the uh, you know art of relationships and building relationships really is done best in person because then you have, you know, the body language, the voice tone, the eye contact and all of that marvelous. And you can, you know, share, break bread, so to speak. Um, but I think that social media has its place in that it gives this 
much larger connection and web that you can connect with people that you wouldn't otherwise. And even within your own community, because, you know, people go to work, go home, you know, go to bed. And there, there isn't maybe, you know, the, the no network that there was before where people would go to church or they would belong to service clubs or have these other kinds of venues where they would meet people. So I think the social media has its place where it does host sort of events where people can meet and then meet in person and say, oh, um, you know, thanks for connecting with me on Facebook or I saw you on LinkedIn and we're, we're friends and uh, it gives you that icebreaker, so to speak, that you've got something that you've already know a little bit about them, you know where they work, you know some of their interests. Hey, I saw you got a new dog, um, you know, last week from, from the shelter, that's cool. And it just gives you that, that intro um, and then you can start up and building that stronger relationship. So I agree. I think that art of relationship building um, is back and it's really important. There was one word that jumped into my head as I was listening to you, Carl, ask the question, and that is play. Play. And the reason I'm thinking about this on many levels is uh, I have a seven and a half year old son and we limit technology and screen time immensely, way less than what the U.S. pediatric crew uh, experts in the U.S. say to do. Um, and I can tell a difference. I can tell a difference when he sees uh, is sitting in front of a screen or using something that I would call two dimensional, right? If he's only writing or he's only doing math or he's only watching a program on TV or he's only playing a video game, his behavior changes. His expectation of how the world is supposed to work versus how it actually works uh, is all wonky for a while. And so I was thinking about that and I'm thinking about some of the companies that I've worked with most recently. And when we get all wrapped up in our own heads and all we can do is work on the problems in front of us and puzzle, puzzle, problem solve, problem solve, react, react. We don't even have a chance to respond. We barely have a chance to breathe. Our stress is really high. I think there's a play that is missing. And not like, let's go get on a slide, which by the way, count me in if anybody wants to do that, call me up, I'll go swing and play on slides all day long. Um, and it could be that concept of just getting out and taking a walk, but it's doing something different. It's, well, if we're always working on these problems over here, what happens if we turn around and we work on something else together instead? Can we see, can we change up our dynamic? Can we find where the ruts are? Have some of that happen. Plus, go out and find a slide. Because um, if you think back, this is a question that was asked of me recently um, in an education class that I was sitting in on. And the question was, think back to your childhood and what is the first memory of true play, however you define play, that pops into your mind? And listening to the results, mine was about My Little Ponies. So that'll tell you a little bit about when I grew up. There's My Little Pony shows. I had My Little Ponies. I went to all the neighbors' houses and I asked them for their cardboard boxes. And I made a My Little Pony city. There's the key I made. I went out and I did something. I came back and I cut it up and I painted it and I made stairs and I made uh, condos and I made a grocery store and I made this place for all these little My Little Ponies to interact. Very three-dimensional. When we're only in our head, when we're only on the computer, when we're only by ourselves, when we're only doing certain things, we're in this other place of um, just two-dimensional, right? This, this, well, it's, we're thinking through this, which by the way, I'm a big proponent of thinking too, so don't take that the wrong way, but it's more of the what are we doing with our hands to add a dimension to everything that we're working on? I love that. And I think humans are hardwired to learn through playing. And, you know, because that's the universal childhood experience. Um, I find it rather depressing, actually, that it seems that um, we've removed a lot of the play opportunity from our schooling. Um, you know, we removed recesses and um, added all kinds of other things that are definitely not play. And I think that is um, hurting our ability to learn as humans. And what it really is, is a, it turns schools into a factory for producing worker drones. The problem is that we aren't in the Industrial Revolution anymore, and we don't need a lot of worker drones. That's 
that's not the model of what it means to succeed in life and to succeed as a society. So um, I, I absolutely do think that play is a part of it. And for me, I, I hadn't thought about the two-dimensional, three-dimensional thing. That's pretty cool. Um, I tend to go towards uh, play is a large component of looking for the unexpected, of um, being outside the box, outside the lines, and you know, relaxing the rules, if you will. Things like that um, is more of how I would describe play. But I, I do like the, the two-dimensional, three-dimensional distinction. That's, that's pretty cool. As a child care director, I just get super excited when I hear that because absolutely in early years, it's all about play. But I also think what it does is for children as well as adults is when we put electronics down is that we increase our ability to uh, foster self-regulation, right? Grow the self-regulation so that uh, we can, you know, we're not immediately uh, responding to ding, 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 right on our phone. Uh, what's that email? What's going coming through as an adult? But you're able to put that down and build up uh, resilience, right? And I think as adults, that if we don't have that resiliency, uh, that's when the stress levels rise, right? So by being able to just put that away, focus on your child's soccer game and um, not be distracted. But same thing with children is that it's not that immediate kind of um, like you get with a video game where it's like an immediate kind of um, uh, attraction, but you're actually able to, like you said, take your time, plan out the condo for the My Little Ponies. That took a lot of organization. That took a lot of planning. You had to physically go and haul all that back to the house and get the scissors and get the tape and get the glue. You know, that takes a lot of planning. So again, there's that whole self-regulation piece, which is so key for adulthood as well, to be a successful adult. Thinking about the pressure and the stress and the fact that we're supposed to know all the answers, whether it's actually our responsibility to have the answers or not, is a whole other ball game. Um, and it makes me think about this phrase, right? That, uh, that you used to hear in sales and people have moved away from it. However, I think there's an element of um, knowing that you're leading by example that maybe fits here. And that's this concept of fake it till you make it. I mean, really most, I, I will admit there are times I will charge forward knowing I have no idea what's happening. There's no way I'm going to get the information, but we have to take a step because that's how we're going to get the information. We have to act so we can come back and figure out what the plan is. And so I'm a proponent of fake it till you make it to find more details until you don't have to fake it anymore, right? So there's that caveat piece. So I'm curious your perspectives around this concept of uh, co confidence and showing it when we don't always have it and how to take that first step to be able to, you know, get information and adjust. Yeah, you know, I, the way I describe it to people is, hey, welcome to being human. Uh, none of us are as confident on the inside as we're display on the outside. So, you know, that that's a part of it. Um, and also, um, you know, relating to play, there's a, there's a sense of what is the risk of screwing up? Um, and so when you can create a play environment, or um, I like to call it experiments, okay, let's Let's run experiments. And the, the reason why I use that word is because um, the word experiment means that failure is allowed as long as you learn from it. You know, so it, it shifts the focus from um, did you achieve exactly the result that you had expected or wanted and to, well, did we learn from it or um, you know, what is it that we can use, you know, maybe building momentum was part of what you were trying to do, uh, why faking it until you make it with, you know, which is perfectly fine. And so I think as leaders, part of what our task to do is how can we set up for our people so that uh, when they are in experimental phase, when they're playing around, when they're trying without a high level of confidence, things like that, how can we make it so that the immediate failure is not going to um, have a huge negative impact on them? Because that makes people resistant. And uh, we, we don't necessarily want to do that. I, I guess the analogy I would have 
uh, comes to mind is that um, you set a child off driving a car for the first time. And, you know, as a parent, that's like totally uh, devastating to, to do that. And it, it shakes you to your bones the first time you hand those kid, uh, keys to your kid. Um, but what do you do? You don't just um, set them out and give the most difficult situations that you would encounter. You don't set them out on a super busy street or say, let's go on the highway and just, you know, go for it. Because the, uh, the risk of failure, um, there's too much, uh, yeah, I mean, you could be killing people or something. I, why would you want to take that kind of risk? So quite naturally, what we do is what I do with my kids, uh, you know, take them around on the parking lot for an afternoon and go around in circles and try to see how things feel and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I didn't have a brake pedal to push on, but on the other hand, how much damage could you do in an empty parking lot on a Sunday afternoon? <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe you ding the car a little bit, but that's probably about the worst, right? Um, so, you know, that's the, the kind of thing that I think leaders bring to it is to say, let's look broader and let's, let's allow people to learn through failure, I guess, if you want to use that term. But a lot of it's fake until you make it, absolutely. So a couple of things come to mind for me. Um, I'm thinking about two different types of action. So one is obvious action where you're, you're just going to go out and um, do it. Um, you're going to, if you, if you need to learn something, you're going to take a formal workshop or you're going to go to school for it. But then I also think the fake it till you make it is that intuitive action where it just feels right, where it's like, you know what, I need to do this. And um, I also think that as a leader, I've been an example for my team of educators at the childcare. I have a team of about 70. And um, I, you know, opened up this new business last year and it was based on intuition. So I had headshots done. I went to a photographer, I had headshots done. And um, uh, I came up with this marvelous whole a dozen photos. And I walked into a marketing agency and I said to them, I'm going to be doing something big. I just don't know what it is yet. And they didn't laugh me out. And they gave me space at the table. And we started talking about what my brand was going to look like. And at that point, we didn't even know yet. I didn't even know yet what I was going to be doing. So um, I came back two weeks later and I said, I've got it. I am going to teach vision boards. I'm going to hold vision board workshops. And then again, that obvious action, I went into work mode and I built curriculum. I built a studio. But what I did was I showed my team of educators that this is possible. And I'm, I'm following my dreams. I'm following my passion. I'm still working there four days a week. I'm giving 100% um, to my other career. And I think actually I'm a better leader in the childcare because I'm finding so much joy in this other aspect of my life. So I think, you know, take it to you, make it. Yes, I, where did that confidence come from? I think it just came from within and I followed the whisper of the woman that was inside me who said, you can do this. And, um, and, and that's what I'm demonstrating to my team. How interesting, Debbie. Yeah. Okay, That's so fantastic. I, I like that example because it, it again shows that, um, you know, yeah, you, you displayed some courage and you went out there and you did that. Fantastic. And you also didn't like mortgage the house to do it. Okay, we didn't take that big a risk. You didn't call up your boss and say, I quit. And, you know, um, that sort of, uh, some people think of it as the American ideal of courageousness is to go out there and do something that's so unbelievable and crazy that um, people are going to sit up and take notice. Well, most of us are in much more modest uh, kinds of situations, fortunately. And, you know, the idea is that, yeah, you can go out there and take a risk and take a, take a little bit of a challenge and give it a try. Um, and you know, what's the, what's the worst that could happen? It's, it's really not that bad. And well, some people bake, right? Some people cross stitch, some people hike, some people run marathons. And I put this concept of vision boarding into that group of, I'm using my brain a different way. I'm 
finding rejuvenation in more than I'm, put, I'm spreading my eggs out across multiple baskets for my own rejuvenation and my own ability to be, to be able to show up and be the best and the most present, which, okay. So this, here's an, this is an interesting thing that was coming up as I was just listening to Carl and then Debbie in your answer. And that is healthy ego and vulnerability. Ha ha. What? Does, where does, you know, where's that inflection point of healthy ego and vulnerability to be, uh, you use the word authentic, uh, Carl, and you use the word present, Debbie. So to you, where is that inflection point? I'm curious. Can I go first? I want to just, I, so I've been thinking and grappling a lot with purpose. What is your purpose? What's my purpose? And I think that Carl, you said it, I think at the beginning when you said about a bigger purpose, about a bigger, it's bigger. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than us. It's it, it, So I think that when I can focus on my purpose and understand that it's bigger than me, that makes me humble, but it also gives me the drive to uh, strive for excellence, to be the very best and to live my best life and to give it my all, but knowing that it's not about me. So that, that, sort of negates the ego piece and I don't have to worry about that. Well, and I, I think um, that was actually the word that I was going to mention as well, Debbie, which was humility. Um, the, the fact is that uh, there's a lot of stuff that's larger than any one of us. Um, a lot of things that are outside our control. Um, we'd like to think that we're in control, but we actually aren't. And, um, so you have to develop this sense of humility. And then um, the ego starts being built upon the true value that you can bring to your team, to your organization, to uh, the groups that you're involved in uh, based upon what you can actually do. And so, um, you know, getting rid of the ego part of it, which is um, I need to display excellence in everything because I'm an awesome person, but I won't tell people that I'm not totally awesome. Um, that's sort of the traditional definition of ego and, and shifting it to uh, how do we have confidence that's based upon uh, real ability to deliver and real ability to impact the world. Um, and the more that we can do that for our teams, by the way, of helping to build up their true confidence, as opposed to just saying, rah, 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 you're great people, this is fantastic, I love you to death, and that's all good, okay? But it can also be very fleeting, that um, it, it can disappear in a moment of challenge and unconfidence. Uh, it's like, oh man, I, I thought I was super great and then I messed up. Um, and, you know, that's that to me, Jess, is the, is the balance that we're trying to hit. Um, and as leaders, uh, we try to bring that to more people than just ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I have a healthy ego. Um, and I'm okay with that. In fact, when people first started reflecting that back to me, I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? What? What? And I'm like, wait a second. What if I just owned that? And sure enough, yeah, okay, I do have this concept of healthy ego, but I will also be the first to tell you the most horrible, worst personal stories and per business stories that there are that I have actually experienced or know somebody that has experienced and the takeaways and the lessons from them. Because, you know, we do learn a lot by experience. And I think on one side of the coin, for me, it's I don't want ego to get in the way of my ability, but I also don't want a lack of ego to get in the way of my willingness to take some action that could be good, even if we have to figure out if it is or not. Does that make sense? And so I, I, and I also, yeah, based on going. experience as well, right? So I think yeah. when, when you can look back at experience that what you've experienced and you say, you know what, that went really well, that gives me confidence and I build on that. Yeah. And so it, again, it takes it off of self, but it's based on the experience itself. So it doesn't feel like it's that, yeah, it's strictly all ego. Does that make, is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> well, it does. What do you have, what do you think, Carl? Yeah, I, I think that's right on that um, the 
confidence um, and ego and all these things are tied together so much. Um, and the question is, you know, back to what I talked about at the beginning of, you know, authenticity and integrity and stuff like that. And um, when you are operating from a position of authenticity to say, I own my strengths as much as I own my weaknesses. And, uh, you know, what I have yet to learn, uh, what I currently don't know how to contribute, but I think I can learn. I, I want to learn because I've, I think it's a part of the larger mission that I'm on, my larger purpose in life. I, you know, uh, these things are all tied together. And, you know, this is part of the self-management and it becomes the example we are setting for our teams. What makes it bold to recognize that every action we take is modeling a behavior to somebody else that we are leading by example? So bold um, means standing in the place of making movement, even when you, uh, the world is telling you that you suck or you, you're not doing it right. Um, and to say it's important. And so therefore I will do it anyway. And I will fake it until I make it. <laughs> I will learn as I go along. I will try and fail and then try again to maybe succeed. You know, they, the heroes of the world are not the people who, uh, who go out and do courageous things. It's the people that do courageous things in spite of the challenges. That's what makes you a hero. That's what makes you truly courageous rather than just going out and doing something magnificent that people applaud you for. So being bold to me is um, not going along with the norm and what culture may say is the perfect workplace and that, you know, you've got to lead with, um, you know, lots of policies and so forth. And I think that by um, leading with kindness and uh, treating the employees the way that I want them to treat the, the children. So in our childcare, where we see each child is capable, competent, curious, full of potential, that's how I want to see each one of my employees. And I think that at times culture, um, you know, corporate might think that I'm being too soft and that I'm um, naive in the way that I'm viewing my employee. But I think that by having each one feel like they belong, that their work is valued and that they matter, uh, that's the kind of workplace that I want to be in and that I want to promote. And that's being bold. You will find all the program notes at voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P185. That is voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P for program 185. You may also search the site for you are leading by example. It's your turn now that you've listened and watched to keep this conversation going. Use hashtag VBB radio. Email us at radio at reddirection.com. Tell us what you think of this program. Tell us your experience of somebody who has been a great model leading by example, and maybe even somebody who's not. And if you're really brave, share with us your own story of when you know you've led well by example, and when you have led poorly by example. It's through your experiences, my experiences, Carl's experiences, Debbie's experiences, that we can glean information to use in the next situation that we come across. Let's learn from each other here. Put what we're talking about into practical everyday use and apply it. Remember, you are leading by example. The Voice of Bold Business Radio gives you insights about how to achieve your company's growth strategy. When you aren't seeing the growth results you want, it's time to get an outside perspective. To discuss your specific situation around growth strategy, work with us. Visit voiceofboldbusiness.com and click find out more. Special thanks to the Scott Treatment for technical production. Thank you for joining us.